The story of a widow who tragically followed in her husband's footsteps, the prelim report is out on the Nepal ATR crash. Meltdown continues at Continental, and the Warbird training rules have been changed. And more aviation news on this episode of Taking Off. Hi, I'm Dan Milliken, and before we hear about the very sad case of the widow who lost her husband in an airplane crash, and get into the prelim report on the tragedy in Nepal, I do wanna give a shout out to our sponsors who make our channel possible, like 67 Designs, the best mounts out there for tablets, phones, and cameras. Check them out in the description below, we have links. So two years ago, the FAA came against some warbird training and their findings set a very dangerous precedent that receiving training in your experimental is a commercial endeavor, so you can't do it unless you're granted a letter of deviation authority or a LOTA from the FAA. Well, the FAA won a court ruling that almost all flight training in experimental aircraft was contrary to FAR 91.319 Section A2. There was a lot of fuss at the time with EAA and AOPA and others pressuring the FAA that did no good and Congress. And here's what EAA President Jack Pelton said at the time. There are other rulings, one that occurred in Florida in 1985 that is exactly the counter to what they did. And that should have been a precedent that that, that ruling is out there. And they ignored that ruling and decided to, to put in place their own reinterpretation. And so the chief the counsel, I, uh, Mark Baker and I met with him on a Zoom call on, on Thursday and we listened to him go on and on and on about his particular position on that. I, I personally said I'm very embarrassed and insulted because your father was an EA board member for many, many years, um, which is not a great place to be if you're the chief, chief counsel of the FAA and, and not understanding general aviation. But, Shame doesn't go very far in trying to get him to reverse it. He's sticking by it. I mean, he's, he's entrenched. So the only way we're going to get it reversed is do, do it through legislation. Well, the legislative lobbying has worked, and with the passage of the James M. Inhofe National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2023, the FAA has been forced to rescind their dangerous flight training policy. And here's what the new law says. A flight instructor, registered owner, leaser, or leasee of an aircraft shall not be required to obtain a letter of deviation authority from the administrator of the Federal Aviation Administration to allow, conduct, or receive flight training, checking, and testing in an experimental aircraft if the flight instructor is not providing both the training in the aircraft, no person advertises or broadly offers the aircraft as available for flight training, checking, or testing, and no person receives compensation for use of the aircraft for a specific flight during which flight training, checking, or testing was received other than expenses for owning, operating, and maintaining the aircraft. While there are still circumstances that will require a LOTA, now if you want to receive flight training, in most cases, you will not need a LOTA. This is great news to the general aviation and nice to see that advocacy by EAA and AOPA is working. All right, update on the Continental six-cylinder woes. Continental has been a bit vague in warning about new six-cylinder engines, and Cirrus, who uses them in their SR-22, grounded their own planes as a precaution. Well, Continental's vagueness is clearing up just a little. As we reported last week, the issue is that the snap rings that hold the pins that hold the crankshaft counterbalance may have been installed incorrectly. If your plane has a Continental six-cylinder manufactured between June 1st, 2021 and February 7th, 2023, then you're faced with a big fix for a small ring engine open heart surgery. The fix is pulling the rear cylinder or even both to check the snap rings. But Continental has issued a notice that if your engine has over 200 hours, then you're good. I guess if it was gonna fail, it would have by now. Uh, that's just a little bit scary. The fix is going to be extremely time consuming. And one thing not talked about is the stress on the A&P market for general aviation. They're hard to find and get in for service as it is now, let alone adding this time consuming job to the marketplace. I hope your airplane engine isn't one of the affected ones. Uh, mine isn't. 
The prelim accident report of the horrible ATR crash in Nepal is out. For those who don't know or don't remember, on January 15th, a Yeti Airlines flight crashed on final approach into the new Pokhara airport and all 72 passengers and crew were killed. This one's been made even more viral by the video recording by someone inside the plane who was live streaming for the landing. From the video outside captured, it appears to be a classic stall spin from being too slow and low. But the Nepalese Aircraft Accident Investigation Commission released its preliminary report and it points to a simple mix up at the controls. Juan Brown at Blanco Lirio has a great rundown for the details, so check out his video. And on the flight deck were two captains, one training the other on getting familiar with the new airport, a familiarization flight. In the left seat was the captain getting the training and was the pilot flying. In the right seat was the supervising captain and was the pilot monitoring. His name was Kamal KC and had almost 22,000 hours. The left seat captain getting the familiarization training was Anju Katawadi, who had an incredible story. Her husband was a pilot and she was a nurse when he died in a Yeti Airlines 2006 plane crash. She left nursing, took the insurance money from his death, went to the United States and chased pilot training for years, raising her daughter with the help of her parents. And when she had completed her training, she went back to Nepal and got a job for the same airlines her husband had flown with, Yeti Airlines, in 2010. She rose to the rank of captain and had over 6,400 hours by the time she was sitting in the left seat that day with a supervising captain in the right. While they were in the downwind to the base part of the landing pattern with flaps set to 15 degrees for the approach at an altitude of 721 feet above the ground, the autopilot system was disengaged and then Anju, the left seat captain, the pilot flying, called for flaps 30 and Kamal, the pilot monitoring, repeated back flaps 30 but the flight data recorder shows that flaps were never extended, but instead the props were feathered at that moment. On the ATR, the flap control is next to the prop feathering control. Again, thanks to Blanco Lirio for the images. For those who aren't pilots out there, the term feathering refers to the angle that the propeller blades make, how much bite they take to produce the thrust. And when a propeller is feathered, that means it's not taking any bite. And within seconds, Anju verbalizes something's wrong with the engines. Four seconds later, the master caution chime started. The flight crew continued with the before landing checklist and turned left to enter the base leg. During that turn, getting slow with a 30 degree bank angle, Anju asked her supervisor if they should continue the term, which Kamal replied, continue. Again, Anju asked that they should continue the descent, and Kamal said, just add power. Of course, the engines with the props feathered, power does no good, and the plane is effectively a glider. And here's an interesting note, about 22 seconds after the props were feathered, someone went ahead and extended flaps 30. Whoever did that didn't question the earlier call out that the task had been accomplished, and that would have been a clue something was wrong, but the clue went unheeded. Then, 13 seconds after flaps went to 30, Anju mentioned twice there was no power. Then the engines were moved to maximum power position. A few more seconds later, Anju handed the controls over to Kamal, and six seconds later, the stick shaker, that's the stall warning, occurred. The aircraft was at 311 feet above the ground, and a few seconds later, the aircraft stalled, banked left abruptly, and crashed. And from the time of the feathering of the props to the crash was exactly one minute. 60 seconds was what they had to troubleshoot and try to figure out what went wrong. A simple but deadly mistake. One other puzzle from the prelim report, the interim safety recommendation is to conduct a comprehensive study to determine the appropriate flight path. I don't get this. Maybe someone can shed some light in the comments below. I would think the safety recommendation would be for better troubleshooting procedures, uh, increased training of landing approaches. To me, the flight path was not the problem. The problem was an extremely experienced supervising captain made a critical error in feathering when he thought he was extending the flaps. Then in the final seconds, he made another crucial mistake. After taking the controls, he stalled the airplane instead of gliding it to the ground. Maybe a comprehensive study on the flight path would cure this? I just don't get that. Okay, that's it for the Aviation News of the Week. Thanks for watching. 
please check out our sponsors. We personally vet each one and the products and the services offered. We use them and they're all run by pilots so we can keep them in, in, we can keep it all in the aviation family. Remember, superior judgment trumps superior skills. Check out our NTSB prelim report on the ground crew ingested into an engine at Montgomery Regional on New Year's Eve. Take care, stay safe. Thank you.